Hi guys, welcome back. Um, those of you that are in my class will recognise the rubbish projector. Um, hopefully it is clear enough for you to read. So I'm, I'm doing this slightly out of order um, because obviously I'm prioritising those who are in my class. So if you are one of my year 10s, you should recognise this because we did it earlier this week or we started it, didn't quite get to finish it. Um, there were also quite a few people who were already off isolating at that point. So I'm actually going to go through the whole thing again. If you have already um, done most of this, uh, you're welcome to skip ahead onto, um, onto the part that we got up to in class. So this is the study uh, of dispositional factors. Being, so those personal uh, traits or dispositions which determine the way that we behave in social situations. And the study which links to that theory was done um, back in 2011 and it was done as a case study um, into the riots which took place in Tottenham um, across the summer of 2011 and those riots were a response to the shooting of Mark Duggan. So this study is a little different to the others that we look at because rather than being done by a particular researcher um, it was done by an organisation, the, the National Centre for Social Research I think, um, which we just abbreviate to NatSEN. The lead researcher on it was Morel, um, but in the specification and in exams they will use the NatSEN abbreviation to refer to this study. Another thing that sets this one apart is rather than being an experiment, as most of the ones that we talk about are, this is a case study. So hopefully you remember from research methods the difference, but a case study is where there are no variables identified, there isn't a hypothesis, it's an investigation which is much more open-ended and there'll be certain questions that will direct that investigation, but it's not designed in a way where you're trying to prove a specific point it's more of an exploration. And that's exactly what this was. There had been a history of riots and of social unrest in this area, um, dating back to the 80s. There have been deaths on both sides historically, and so there is a feeling within the community of mistrust of the police. And there's also probably a feeling within the police of mistrust and concern. If you've seen colleagues um, killed or seriously injured in these situations, that's going to be in the back of your mind in the way that you respond to them. So we're not trying to make a judgment on who was right, who was wrong and all those kinds of things, which is the major narrative that you will see. This was more of an exploration into why did people as individuals choose to engage or not engage in this riot and uh, these series of riots, days of kind of unrest and anarchy as they unfolded. Um, so as we see here, the aim was just to better understand that. There was no kind of uh, pre-decided variables or hypothesis. So as I said, instead of a hypothesis and variables, um, I've kind of left them here, but only to illustrate the point that there isn't one. So instead, the purpose was to write a report. So uh, Natsen was uh, asked by the government to conduct research into these riots to try and understand what factors were at play, um, presumably for prevention. And there are three main questions that directed the research, and those are here. First of all, what happened? Obviously, if the media was reporting it, but what happened from the perspective of those who were involved? Uh, who was involved and why and how did the various young people get involved in those riots. So as I've already alluded to, uh, the design of this study was a case study, it wasn't an experiment. It was um, a report, or it was uh, written as a report rather, but the actual research was a case study. And, um, and because it is a case study, we don't have the same sampling methods uh, there doesn't usually need to be a very large sample in a case study, and certainly this was the case. So even though there were probably thousands of people involved in this, the sample was only 36. It was 36 individuals, and there were, um, there were some variety. There was a bit of a range there um, in terms of age and uh, gender and ethnicity. But these were predominantly people who've been involved at a fairly high level. Um, as you can imagine, if you've been involved in a riot and in looting, you're probably not jumping for opportunities to speak to the police or the government. Um, 
like I said, there's generally a feeling of distrust between those two. So the vast majority of these participants were actually already in custody. They'd already been charged and arrested and did this research probably as part of their sentence. Um, most of them were in, still in full-time education, but that was representative of the people who were involved in the riots. So the procedure, in terms of how they actually did the case study, how that was carried out, um, it was carried out using interviews. And those interviews were conducted five weeks after the riots had occurred, which in terms of research is pretty quick, but in terms of your own memory of events, five weeks, if I asked you what happened five weeks ago, you're probably gonna struggle. So that's obviously uh, a factor. Um, informed consent was gained. You know, the people agreed to do it. However, they probably didn't have a lot to lose at this point. There were a lot of people who would have been involved who wouldn't have given that consent, unfortunately. And so it's not, we can't be sure that this represents all the perspectives. Uh, however, they were assured that anything that they said would be kept anonymous and confidential, so they didn't need to worry that there'd be any further uh, criminal charges, for example, if they described how they were involved in the things that they'd done uh, as part of those riots. Okay, so just diving into the kind of meat of this case study. Um, so whereas with other studies, the results are normally quite short and succinct, you may be summarized in a graph, when you're doing a case study, that is not the case. Um, pun intended I guess, they are, um, this, is, this is what we call qualitative research. So the studies we've looked at so far have, always, have all been quantitative and what that means is that they, the results are in the form of numbers, they give you quantities. You can produce means, you can draw graphs, it's really simple and easy to summarise those results and it tends to condense everything. But it's also reductionist because you don't get that depth of detail. In a qualitative study, like this one, it is full of that depth of detail. But that's a double-edged sword. It's great to know all that information, however, it takes much more time and effort because you have to sift through it all and read it and digest it and understand it. You can't just memorise a couple of numbers. So there is a lot. The results is not going to fit in the results section of one of those A3 sheets, which is why I've not used one. They just don't apply to case studies. Um, so, yeah. Uh, strap yourself in, there's quite a lot of information here. So first of all, the first research question was what happened in the riots? Now, this is fairly straightforward. It was reported in the media and it's basically just the events of, um, this is the first day of the riots. There were several days, but actually this was kind of what triggered it and how it began. So some of you may remember the story. There have been similar instances in the media since. Um, Mark Duggan, was a, uh, a resident of Tottenham, if you like, he lived in a fairly rough area, to be fair, and he had been uh, kind of watched by the police for suspected um, involvement um, with dodgy dealings. You don't need to know all the details. Um, the actual details of what happened remained unclear for quite a long time, and particularly to the family. So his parents weren't told that he had been shot by police. Um, spoiler alert, he got shot. Um, they found out on the news at the same time everybody else did. And so the family were angry, they were upset, there were a lot of questions they didn't have answers to. And so they decided that as family and friends that they would walk uh, in a peaceful protest to the local police station um, in Tottenham. And there were about 300 people who did that. And that happened on the afternoon of the 6th of August. Um, Obviously, the police were not necessarily able to help them or give them the answers that they wanted, whether uh, through their own fault or not, the family uh, weren't happy. Later on into the early evening, things started to get a little bit more turbulent. People started throwing things, they were shouting, chanting, and actually at, uh, at 20 past seven, there was a police car that was set on fire. And that kind of sparked a change. At that point, um, it's not clear, but many of Mark's family actually uh, went home and things then transformed from this peaceful protest into a state of rioting and kind of anarchy. And over the next few hours, as you can see, hopefully read on the board, um, the police uh, came to try and contain the riots, violence escalated and there was, uh, there was damage and 
Um, by late that evening, the shops had been set on fire, um, places had been broken into and looted, and it was just absolute chaos and pandemonium on the streets. I remember sitting up late and watching this live on the news with my wife actually when it was happening, and it was, su it was just surreal. It felt like we were watching a, a movie or something. Um, it just, yeah, completely bizarre. Now on to who was involved, the next kind of research question. Now this may be tricky for you to read. Um, the report categorised involvement into four categories. And those categories are here. So escalating from the non-involved through to watchers, through to rioters, and then finally to people involved in the looting. And within those four categories were different types of people. So for example, the first category, the non-involved, um, there were two different types of non-involved people. The first were people who chose to stay away. They knew what was going on, but they actively decided I am not going to get involved in that. This is not good, not a good idea, whatever. Then you had wannabes, people who were not involved, but actually wanted to be. So they were looking on with interest, thinking, I wish I was there. Um, again, they're not specific what factors kept them out at this point, but we will look at some of them later. Then moving up in involvement, we had watchers. So we had people not watching on the media, but physically there. And again, two different categories. The first, bystanders, are people who just happened to be passing by. So they lived in the area, worked in the area, and they were just there, okay? They didn't get involved, but they were there and they saw what was happening. And then, I guess, uh, slightly up from that were people who were the curious, and those are the people who knew what was going on, and they chose to go and observe. So they left their homes, they walked or drove to go and check it out because it was interesting and a lot of the footage that you will find online um, was by this group so there were people who went with cameras deliberately walking and driving through the riots trying to document what was going on at the time moving up then to people who were physically uh, more active and involved the rioters here you've got three different categories so the rioters were people first who were protesting so they were upset about the the death of Mark Duggan, and some of those protesters did uh, become violent. They began to abuse the police and things like that when they didn't get the answers that they wanted. The next step up were retaliators. So these were people who were peacefully protesting until the police started to intervene, try and disperse them, move them on, or perhaps they saw violence being, uh, being perpetrated against others. Um, and so at that point they decided that they would uh, that they would retaliate. The third category for this are the thrill seekers. So these are the people who weren't particularly uh, bothered or connected to the death of Mark Duggan. They just saw that the riots were occurring and so they decided to come and join in. So they wanted to riot and they used the protest and the existing unrest as an excuse to go and get involved in all this crazy, exciting anarchy. The final one, looters. Again, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. You know, people may have progressed from one to the other, but the looters fell into two categories. The first were opportunists. So these were people who happened to be in the area or happened to be in the protest. And when they saw that shops had been ransacked and smashed open, they took that opportunity to go in and steal stuff. Uh, I, on one of the short documentaries that you can see on YouTube, um, there was a young girl, I think she was 16 years old, she'd been out with her friends and on her way back home she just was walking and, and happened to be in one of these riots. Um, JD Sports had all been smashed in and people were in taking stuff and she just got swept along. She went into the shop, couldn't believe what was going on, everyone was stealing stuff. She picked up a pair of trainers and walked out of the store with them. She was an opportunist. Unfortunately for her, because she wasn't actually involved in the riots, she'd been out with her friends, she was dressed nicely and she was very recognisable. So the police were able to track her on CCTV and she got a knock on the door and was arrested um, and, and sentenced for her involvement, which kind of seems unlucky, um, but it was because she stood out so much. Uh, the next category above that, are the sellers and so these are people a little bit more like the thrill seekers who they know what's going on and they are deliberately 
deliberately targeting places and um, coordinating the uh, basically the looting. So they're deciding, right, we want to raid this place, steal all the stuff from it, um, so that they can sell it, so that they can make money from it. They weren't just they didn't just happen to be in the area. Carrying on then onto the third question, how and why were people involved? Again, there's a lot of information here. So the key motivations for people becoming involved in these riots were, uh, well, were here. First of all, they were enjoying the excitement. It is exciting, particularly to, um, to a certain demographic of people, um, mainly young men, to be honest, uh, teenage boys find this kind of thing particularly exciting. The second main motivation was being able to get stuff without paying for it. The, the looting, that's an exciting prospect. It's just like a free-for-all. Um, you're probably too young to remember Supermarket Sweep. But there used to be this game show where uh, you know, if you answered questions correctly, you just got a trolley and you got to run around a supermarket and you could just chuck anything in the trolley that you wanted. And that's kind of how people were viewing this. And a lot of them actually did that exact thing, even with a trolley. And then finally, one of the motivations was getting back at the police. Particularly for a lot of people, they'd already had run-ins with the police. There was a history of this, either their parents or themselves had had those experiences. And so this was an excuse and an opportunity to kind of get revenge on the establishment and get back at the police for all the wrongs that they felt had been done to them. So, <clears throat> we, so those were the main factors, um, but Nat Sen wanted to be much more specific about exactly what had pushed people to get involved. And so what they did was they separated factors into two categories, basically nudge factors, which nudged people to get involved. So those were the things that pushed them into the uh, involvement in the riots, or tug factors, which were things that, that held them back from getting involved. So the next slide summarizes all the different nudge and tug factors uh, that were spoken about by the people that were interviewed in this. The research that we have looked at, the theories we've looked at in the social influence topic have been split between situational and dispositional factors. And although this piece of research is nested in the dispositional factors um, theory, it actually does cover both. Because as you can imagine, in a case study, you're gonna get a huge amount of information and that's going to be both situational and dispositional because those are the two competing things which determine how people behave. So this is kind of a nice way to almost wrap up the whole um, of the topic with both theories. So first we'll look at the dispositional factors. Those are what we've been talking about more recently. The dispositional factors which affected people's decisions um, during these riots were first of all previous criminal activity. So, although this isn't one of the dispositional factors, it was a personal factor. Have you personally uh, been involved with the police in the past? And actually that could go one of two ways. It could nudge you into or tug you away from involvement. So, for example, if you already have a criminal record and you've been involved with the police, that might nudge you to get involved because you might think, what have I got to lose? Or you might think, hey, I've gotten away with it in the past. Or you know, any of those thoughts. However, if you have maybe done time in prison or you've suffered a fine or something like that, then that memory, um, that sort of rehabilitation, if you like, might actually be effective. And you might think, I'm not going to get involved because I know the risks and I don't want to go there again. So this previous criminal activity could, it, it was for some a nudge and for some a tug factor. The next one is people's attitudes towards authority. So this links to the theory that we talked about with Adorno and authoritarian personality, but it also links to some of the stuff that we've talked about on, on culture. Again, a lot of people in this area were very cynical towards the police, toward the government, toward politicians, and they'd had negative experiences with them in the past. And so that might have nudged them to get involved, particularly if they felt that they, it was an opportunity to sort of get revenge or show the government or the police that they can't get away with it. On the other hand, um, a lot of people had not had negative experience with the police. Maybe they had even family members who were part of the police force 
and so wouldn't want to get involved um, for that reason. So again, could have been a, nug, a nudge or a tug factor. And then finally, for the dispositional, is people's prospects. Now, by prospects, this is kind of like their ambition, the opportunities, the future that they were looking forward to. And this is a really big one. And this is a big reason why the people who were involved were mainly, they all had quite a lot in common. They were generally young, still in education. Um, they didn't have their own jobs and families to support in that same way. They didn't have those responsibilities that might have made them behave in a more sensible um, moral way. So and the nudge factor here was if they had poor prospects, if they had low income, limited hope for the future, it was kind of a bit of a nothing to lose attitude. Why not? However, if people were doing well at school, they had aspirations and expectations of, uh, of a, a good and a successful future, that stopped them. That was a big tug factor because if you're doing really well at school, the last thing that you want is to get arrested for stealing a pair of trainers, miss all that time, you know, that could really derail your future. And so, again, it mainly affected those who didn't feel like they had that hope or those prospects. Almost there, finally, the situational factors. So these were the external influences that um, made a difference on how people acted. The first was family attitudes. So relatives, uh, so if you had other members of your family that were involved or that had had issues with the police in the past, then that was a big nudge factor. It was, it's kind of almost like a micro culture there. Like this is what we do. We hate the police. Um, they're all unfair and unjust. Um, many of you might remember studying Terror Kid in English. Um, and, and there's a lot of overlap. It kind of discusses in, in, uh, in detail some of these issues. And uh, for Rico, the protagonist in that story, um, his dad had a history of this kind of thing as well. So uh, on the other hand, tug factors. Um, if you had parents who actually were supportive of the police and wanted you to keep the law, then that was a big factor. You know, a lot of parents said, you're not going out, not getting involved in that. You know, as it might seem like a, I don't know whether you, you think it's harsh. Um, as a parent myself, I think that's very sensible. If there were riots going on in my town, I would not be letting my kids just go off and, uh, and disappear out and, uh, yeah, and just expect that that would all be fine. So family attitudes made a big difference. The second was community, and this links kind of to the culture stuff that we talked about in situational factors. So a lot of people felt part of a community um, and, and there was almost a feeling there of them being victimized by the police um, and kind of targeted there. And so there was almost a feeling of, I need to go out, protect my community. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna show the police that they can't treat us this way. And, uh, and it was part of that identity. On the other hand, there were aspects of that community and no doubt there would have been families and, and groups of people with the opposite view of actually, we don't want to destroy our community. We don't want to ruin the livelihood of our neighbors, of the people who live around us. Um, particularly the re religious communities um, who obviously would, uh, would discourage violence and, and dishonesty and stealing and stuff like that. And so th those communities were powerful. Again, in one of the documentaries that talks about this, there's a young, uh, a young man there who had uh, sketchy history and had run-ins with the police but actually he'd converted to Christianity and he'd kind of turned his life around and so he went around trying to stop people getting involved in these riots because of those morals which had developed through his religious uh, conversion. The next one, belonging. Again this is linked and very similar to community um, but a lot of people felt like they, although they belonged in their community, that they almost didn't belong to the country. They don't feel an allegiance or a love for our nation, for the government, for the law and for the police. Uh, they feel like those things are not serving them, so why should they be bothered? And so that was a nudge factor that might um, make them want to get involved. On the other hand, some people did feel like they actually were proud of this nation, proud of their city, proud of their neighborhood, and would not want to damage it and not want to harm local business owners. And so that would have tugged them and stopped them from damaging uh, and from getting involved in the rioting. Finally, poverty and materialism. 
So if you remember when we talked about culture, we talked about collectivist and individualist cultures, but we also talked about what causes antisocial behaviour. And that, if you remember, was when there is, um, a, where, where there's massive financial inequality in a country uh, combined with quite low levels of income. So you've got a small group of people who are living it up and driving around in gold-plated Lamborghinis and most of the people who are scraping, um, scraping a living and starving and suffering with illness and all those kinds of things. That causes a lot of anger. And, and there were people in the communities who did actually feel that way. Although there aren't exactly those levels of poverty in these places, there were a lot of people who felt like they had no opportunity to get the expensive stuff that they wanted. And so a big nudge factor here was the riots gave an opportunity for that. I can go into whatever shop I want, steal whatever I want. On the other hand, there were people who were doing all right for themselves and who felt like actually that was completely out of order. And one of the interesting kind of events that I think happened on, on day two and three and actually kind of did a lot of good to put an end to these riots was that other local class working people saw what was going on and they got angry because they were working hard to earn a decent honest living to provide for their family and they were watching these people tear down their societies, smash up the community, burn and steal stuff and so regular working class men would get back from work and then they would gang up with the rest of the uh, of the people from their neighborhood and they went and patrolled their streets so that the looters and the rioters couldn't affect their neighborhood. Um, this happened particularly there's a predominantly Turkish area um, which was kind of right in the middle of where a lot of this was kicking off and the Turkish people living there were not happy they did not want that happening in their area so they went out onto the streets almost as a, a counter mob if you like and stopped the rioters and chased them off and so you can see that there were people who, although they weren't very wealthy, they recognised that they were trying their best to do it right and be honest. And that not only stopped them getting involved in the riots, but it actually was a big role in them going out and preventing further damage from the riots in their areas. OK, almost done now. Conclusions and criticisms. The conclusions of this are almost self-explanatory from the level of detail we've gone into you can probably draw these yourself but the three that are really pointed out in the uh, in the textbook and most likely I suppose to come up on the exam are first of all that collective and crowd behavior that situational factor has a huge influence on people's behavior particularly on antisocial behavior the second one is that moral development, people's personal moral beliefs, um, things like authoritarian personality and those dispositional factors also play a big role in people's involvement and the level of their involvement in these events. And finally, I suppose, is kind of the balance between the two. So each individual is doing a sort of unconscious risk assessment here, a weighing up the situational factors with their own personal dispositional factors to try and make the choice that feels right for them. Finally, looking at a couple of criticisms, all these questions were asked five weeks after. And like I said at the start, that's not a huge length of time, but it is long enough that your memory might not be completely reliable. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that have already looked at the memory topic, when we talked about reconstructive memory particularly, these type of events are particularly susceptible to uh, having memories actually change because the information that you're hearing from other people and from the media are going to actually work their way into your own memories. So one of the criticisms here is that we can't completely rely on the reports that were given during those interviews because things can change. Um, second criticism is that the distrust of the government and authority, which led to these riots in the first place, will also have kind of biased the interview data. Because interview uses self-report, you know, you're relying on what people tell you, people, um, it, would have had, it would have had a huge influence from things like social desirability, maybe even demand characteristics, where those being interviewed are not gonna say things that make them look 
like mindless thugs, for example. And so maybe actually they were thinking of a justification for their behavior afterward, which had not been in their mind at the time, but they don't want to just, but they, may, they want to sound like they were justified in what they did. So that'll be social desirability. They also may have had a hunch of what the researchers were looking for. And so they may have answered um, in a way that they felt would be uh, either giving the researcher what they wanted or not giving them what they wanted, depending on how they felt about them. And then the final thing was the, the sample. Now, it's usually not really fair to criticize the sample of a case study because in a case study, you're very limited in the sample because you're just looking at that specific case. And so there's not a lot that they could have done, but we still need to be realistic about that. There was definitely a bias in this sample. Lots of people did not want to talk about their involvement. They didn't want to admit it. So there were huge groups of people who just couldn't be involved. We couldn't find their views because they wouldn't share them. Most of the people who were asked were in prison. And the only reason they agreed was because they'd already been caught. They couldn't, you know, they had nothing else to do basically um, because it had already sort of gone wrong for them. So that's not representative because most of the people involved in the riots didn't go to prison. And so you're probably going to get a slightly skewed perspective. Um, all that said, it is, uh, you know, it's a good way to kind of wrap up this topic and look at how situational and dispositional factors both play a role in determining our social behavior. So that is the second study in the social influence topic, uh, Natsen, looking at the Tottenham riots in 2011.